So you bought a right-hand drive car from Japan. Now what? You spend all that time finding your importer, like top rank imports. You spend even more time finding the car, working with the importer, dealing with the auction, waiting and waiting and waiting. And then you get the call that your car is coming and you're so excited. You get it and then what? First things first, you better wash it. This video is sponsored by Detailers Roadmap. These guys are the gurus when it comes to building websites. I originally did our first website because I wanted to save some money, but the problem was, while it's not too hard to figure out how to put some images and words together on a site that look okay, we actually put ourselves at a disadvantage because I didn't know how to properly set it up. Keywords, descriptions, and other important key elements help your site rank on the search engines. Most people find you on the internet. This is no secret. Having a properly set up site is gonna get you more leads and make you more money. Take some time, go talk with the Detailers Roadmap crew and see how they can help you get found with a professional website. Link in the description below. So I always like to start with the dirtiest part of the car first. In this case, it's wheels and tires. With the R33, these wheels are highly sought after. I wouldn't think that an inspector over there in Japan is really gonna go super deep into worrying about the condition of the wheels. If you do get a set of wheels with some nicks, with some curbing, with some damage, there's a ton of wheel people who can fix them, but we always wanna get in there to be able to see exactly what we're dealing with. So to clean your wheels and tires, there's a ton of videos out there, super easy though. We just look for an iron and fallout remover, and we're looking for a citrus all purpose cleaner to clean the tires. I start both the wheels and the tires dry before I rinse it off to allow the chemical to do its work. To start, we're simply just gonna spray our all-purpose cleaner on the tire, looking to kill any dressing that may be on there, start lifting the dirt, opening up the pores, and really getting a nice thorough clean. While that sits, we're gonna start activating that iron allowing the cleaner a good amount of time to do what it's got to do, to let it eat, and to end with a phenomenal result. When we're talking about wheels and brushes, we want to use a stiff nylon brush for the rubber and a softer shredded nylon microfiber or soft bristle brush for the wheels. We never want to use the coarse nylon brush on the wheels. The small brushes are great for getting in all of the small nooks and crannies lug nut recesses, emblems. If you're dealing with a wheel that hasn't been cleaned in some time, that's caked up with iron on a heavy brake pad, something like a GTR would come with, focus a bit more in the crevices where the, where the brake dust may have been staining over the years. The iron remover is gonna help you see that because you're gonna see the really dark, drippy sections. It's gonna let you know that there's a ton of iron in there. You're gonna wanna go in there and agitate it out with your brush. Once you get the wheel real clean, we can start to see little defects like this, this scratch from back when, and you may even come and find that there may have been a repair here. We have some clear coat, looks like delamination. It could have been a hit and a light repair again. Nothing to get upset about. The car has come from quite a long ways and it's been, it's lived quite a journey already. While you're down here, it's never a bad idea to take a little bit of your all purpose cleaner, spray it up in the wheel wells, let it dwell a little bit, just to break up some of that decades or so of buildup without going too crazy. Just like the wheels, we're gonna take our soft brush and agitate as needed. All right, so once we get our wheels clean, rinsed off, inspect for damage, we're just gonna give it a very basic wash. Now, before you go ahead and talk about how many buckets we're using and so on and so forth, this is really for the guy or girl who just got this car. It's 30 years old, it hasn't been paint corrected. We're just gonna do a quick, safe wash. How are we gonna do that? Bucket, some water, a grit guard, high quality microfiber wash mitt, and a couple of capfuls of your favorite soap. So 
So we're always going to start out of the sun, preferably somewhere in the shade. Southern California's today, though. Looks like the sky installed our shade. We're always going to rinse the car off first. And a few pro tips. So we're always going to go top to bottom. Doesn't matter if we're washing the hood. This is the top onto the bumper. This is the bottom. We're always going to wash top to bottom. We're not going to come down here, get all this dirt and bring it back up to the top. Same thing with the roof, top all the way down to bottom. Don't be scared to go back to your bucket as needed. The more trips to the bucket means the more dirt you're putting in, into the bottom of the bucket and the less dirt you're dragging around the car. The wash process is a really good time to get to know the finish, get a really good feel for it. Even though the soap is slippery, you can feel how rough the surface is. You can hear it with the glove. I'm not surprised from something that's been sitting either in indoor or outdoor storage for potentially the last couple of years. So now we got it clean. As we talked about during the wash, you can hear the grit on the surface. You can feel it, you can hear it. I'm surprised you really can't see it. These cars either sit in indoor storage or outdoor storage for sometimes years until they're legal to be able to be imported into the US. So before we ever touch this car with a polisher, before we go any deeper into detailing, before we look at the paint protection film offerings with the ceramic coating offerings, we have to get this thing as smooth as can be. And there's a couple of different ways to do that. The first way in decontaminating the surface that we like to go for is chemically. Chemically, I believe, is, is the safer way. We're not using an abrasive. We're not really, at the time, even touching the surface. What this chemical is gonna do is, as you saw on the wheels, it is going to allow the surface to be cleaned deeply and safely while removing those iron contaminants, those iron particles. We start on a wet surface by just, like the wheels, spraying the product on. We're gonna be careful to not allow the product to dry but we're not gonna be super worried about it. I know with this product, if it does dry, you can hit it with a little bit of water and it's gonna activate right again. It will not etch or harm the surface. Noticeable areas of iron contamination are behind the wheels, both front and rear. And if it's anything modified like this GTR is, are gonna be anywhere the exhaust is gonna land. And of course the top sections from all of the industrial fallout, train tracks, sitting in a container, sitting on a boat, so on and so forth. Once the iron remover has had about five to 10 minutes to set up, we're just gonna go back quickly and just lightly wash the car. One pro on using a chemical decontamination is it's allowing to get into all of the nooks and crannies that we will not be able to get into mechanically with a clay bar or a clay towel. So now that we've rinsed the iron remover off the surface, we can still hear and feel that it is quite gritty, pretty normal. If for some reason, you need a little amplification device. A piece of cellophane or a plastic bag is gonna allow you to pick up on those high marks, high points of the contaminants and really let you hear that surface. Now, in the world of mechanical decontamination, we have two options. We have the tried and true clay bar and the newer synthetic clay pads. They come in a variety of shapes. Both of them come in different grits, so make sure that you pick the fine or the medium or the hard if you have to. Again, it's all gonna depend on how it sounds. Huge fan of the substitute clay or the clay towels or blocks. They're much faster. I think they last longer. If you drop them on the floor, you can rinse them off and still use them. And they're just a bit more efficient for me. Again, just like the clay, we're gonna keep our fingertips out of the towel. We're gonna make sure we're keeping it flat with very little pressure and listening for the sound to clear up, making multiple trips back to your bucket. So with either clay bar or clay towel, clay mitt, you always wanna lubricate before touching the surface. So we're gonna do short, light strokes, overlapping, until you hear that sound die down. Now this is gonna be very vehicle specific, again, on what clay you choose, what grade you choose, and how long you're working the surface. Once I hear it quiet down, I'm gonna flip it over. I'm gonna use my other side here and you will feel how slick the surface is gonna get, but you will hear the sound go down. We want the clay to lay flat. We do not wanna put our fingertips into the clay. They're gonna to make touch points that if you were to pick up a contaminant, you will guarantee a scratch in the finish when you're done claying. Another good point of the clay bar, 
in inspecting the vehicle surface is you will be able to feel a dry spray of clear coat or a blend. This is gonna remove a lot of the waxes and sealants or anything else that may be on the surface. And once it's dry, we're gonna be able to really see what we're working with. And all of a sudden, all we hear is the crinkle of the bag and a very slight slide of the bag on the surface. That grittiness is gone. Now we're ready to look at paint correction, paint protection film, or a longer lasting or shorter lasting paint protection product, like even a wax if you want to. We never want to apply a protective product on a surface that is that gritty because you're going to have a series of peaks and valleys. And what's going to happen is that the wax sealant or coating is going to break off the peak first and you're going to not have it last as long. So once we're clean, we're chemically decontaminated, we're mechanically decontaminated, it's probably my least favorite time, it's time to dry. Big fan of a high quality microfiber drying towel, or if you have availability to one of the new cordless leaf blowers, that's kind of cool too. So now that we can see what we're working with, she's washed, chemically, mechanically decontaminated and dried, we're ready to go and start looking at if we can find, like detectives, if there was any damage done to this car of the more serious nature. Now, when you think about a car, most of the large hits are either gonna be in the back, in the front, or very obvious on the side. But the majority of them, is the car gonna be rear-ended or if the car would rear-end someone else. So we'll jump in the back first. So things to look for, or indicators to look for, besides the, the, the body gap, which would be where the panels line up. So with the, with the closed, we can take a look at the gaps here versus the gaps here. You don't need any sort of measuring tools or anything special. You're just gonna take a look and see if they're the same. In this case, they are. Other areas to look for is the factory seam seal. Now this could get a little tricky because not every car is done the same in the factory. If you look at this corner here on the driver's side, we can see a little bit of the extra seam sealer and it feels a certain way. The seam sealer is coming down in here and then it's all painted over at the factory and we have seam sealer down here. And we're gonna go and make sure that this looks the same on the other side, which in this case, it does. Now, what would have happened if this quarter panel was replaced or if this whole back corner was hit in, this would be very difficult to replicate. Other indicators, any sort of factory stickers as we see here, up here and up here. Looking very similar. Unfortunately, we're missing one here, but that happens looking very similar, so all pretty much the same. Another good way to see if there was damage done is to take a look at the painted bolts and the painted hardware. If it all looks the exact same, another great sign. If we were curious if the deck lid was ever replaced, you always wanna feel down low and feel if there's any dry spots or overspray from a poorly done paint job. And again, with this car, there's not. A quick way also to verify that we do not think that this car was in any sort of major damage is to take a look at the floor in the trunk. Any car that receives a good bumper hit down low will show signs of it through the metal in here. You would see wrinkles, cranks, similar to what we're seeing here, all the way down as the car got hit. We also wanna take a look at the seam sealer the same way, even though there's no paint on it, and make sure that it looks similar to that of the other side. With this being a mid 90s car, to match that seam sealer, if this was in an accident, say in 2006, 2007, would be very difficult 10 years later. When looking at the side of the car, especially something that's silver or heavy metallic, it's very difficult for a painter, no matter how good they are, to match the color perfectly. So if you look down the side of the car from about a 35 degree angle in any sort of light, if you're able to see a major difference in color, it's a sure sign that something happened. Again, with this car on this passenger side, it looks pretty good. We talked about feeling the edges for dry spots. Very helpful on a door, very helpful on the inside of a jam. Both of these feel really good. The way this would have been repaired is there would be a piece of foam tape inside here with the door closed, allowing the painter to blend over some silver or blend over some clear and inside there would be dry. So onto the driver's side, looking in the jam, we have the factory stickers here. If this car was in an accident or had some sort of damage on this side, these factory stickers that say the tire size and weights and everything else in, in Japanese I can't read, this would be very difficult for a painter to, to tape off 
to get any sort of color or clear in here to be perfect. Like the trunk again, this is an area where if it looks weird, something took a hit. Not a lot of guys are gonna take the time to really body work inside of a, a, a door jam here. So now onto the front of the car, we're gonna look for our potentially dry edges. We're gonna look for painted hardware, symmetric and similar painted seam sealer. And we're gonna look for any sort of buckles in what would be the unibody portion of the car or any of the structural members. Now with a modified car, you're gonna see things like this adjustable strut bar coming on and off the car. You may see your front bolts and your bumper bolts coming off the car if they wanted to upgrade the intercooler or change any of the charge piping or so on and so forth. So it's nothing to spaz out about if you see that, you know, maybe he, the guy or the girl before lost a bolt or something like that. This isn't about trying to find perfect cars. This is about really trying to learn and get to know the car that you may have waited two, three, or six years for. So this R33 is in absolutely great shape. So there's only so much the human eye can pick up. There's no way for me, with all my experience, to touch this paint and to tell you if it's original, how much is there, how much isn't there, so on and so forth. So that's where we have to pull in some of our tools. So what I have here in my hand is a paint thickness gauge, which over the years have become rather inexpensive. And if you're interested in buying and selling cars, reconditioning cars, so on and so forth, it's a great tool to have. It's very simple to use, comes with instructions, obviously, which we've already read. We've calibrated it, not the end of the world, because again, we're not trying to do a forensic inspection of this car. We just want to run around and spec it real fast to see if everything is pretty close. Now, the gauges measure in mils or microns, depending on how you set it up. And when we're talking about mils, we're talking about a very small percentage of what would be a human hair. So don't get upset again if you start seeing measurements that are off a mil or two. A mil or two, for the most part, is very, very, very small, very small. So the way that it works is you just touch it to the paint and it pulls a number. And right here, we're reading 4.0. Now, if we go around the car, even on the same roof, we just gained 0.4, almost half a mil. Again, we're not worried about it because it's all relatively close. So even that drop, it's not the end of the world. What we're looking for is the machine to beep and give us a series of lines. That's bad. That means we have a ton of filler, whether it's your, your Bondo type of body filler, some sort of lead, something like that. So anywhere where there's a potential seam, we really want to look in there because this is going to tell us if something was changed. And you want to see those numbers being very similar to where you're looking on the car. Now, depending on the gauge that you buy, is going to give you what substrates it can read. This one, is gonna give us a series of lines on the fender, as well as a series of lines on the hood. Now, usually, this gets me excited because I found a bunch of Bondo. But in reality, this tells me that this is steel and that this is aluminum. So because the hood and the two front fenders are aluminum, this gauge does me no good. But there's gauges you can have that will help with that. So again, we'll jump over on the roof. And we're just looking to make sure, again, that we're in that three and a half or so ballpark. We don't want to see anything as low as say two and a half, two even. And we definitely don't want to see something over, just call it six. So this isn't so much about getting a pinpoint reading of how much is on the car. Because remember in the nineties, a lot of these were still sprayed by hand. So if I'm bringing my paint over and then my buddy calls me, and I come down here, I'm gonna be light in here, and I'm, I may be heavy up here. It's nothing that we're worried about because the car, everything as it ages, is laid out flat and looks great, but we just wanna make sure that we're not missing anything. Very common areas for rot, your quarter panels, especially for the Honda guys out there. You're probably cringing right now. That's beautiful. If there wasn't a plastic rocker down low, we could get even closer to see what's actually behind the metal. So again, if this is something you're interested in, a paint thickness gauge is an absolute phenomenal tool to have, super easy to use, and it just gives you that data point. 
There's some gauges now that are Bluetooth and actually will print you out of your printer or give you a downloadable form where it will tell you where to spec the car and give you a full printed form with all your measurements. Just kind of cool for the next person or if you're keeping the car forever, you can go back in 10 years and compare the numbers and make sure that nothing has happened if your buddy borrowed it. Thanks for watching again. It's Eric from Car Supplies Warehouse. Hope you learned something in regards to checking out the new to you JDM Dream Car.